Truth Still Matters, episode number eight. Come one, come all. Welcome to the Catholic Podcast. Truth Still Matters. The human person is made for truth. Despite this dictatorship of relativism, we breathe every day. This podcast exists in the stream of the new evangelization championed by Pope John Paul the Great and continue with Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI and Pope Francis. We will have the opportunity to learn and reflect on the timeless truths revealed by God and deposited in the Catholic Church. If you're looking for apologetics or theology that can be applied to your life right now, you've found a new home. Stop drowning in the world of opinion and embrace yourselves for truth still matters. Praise the Lord. It is by God's grace that you and I have made it back for the eighth installment of Truth Still Matters. I am so excited and pumped about this next podcast. The topic of this show is who do people say that Christ is? See, Jesus calls you and I to make a decision. We are either for him or against him. There is no middle ground. As it says in Revelation, he would rather us hot or cold. If we're lukewarm, he's going to spew us out of his mouth. Have you made a decision? Have I made a decision? Stay tuned and you and I together will explore the evidence of why you and I have to make a decision. The topic of this podcast is crucial. It is critical in our Christian identity. Who is Jesus? Jesus is central to Christianity. And as we contemplate this question, we come to a point in the road where we have to take one or two paths. There's a fork in the road. We can take this path or we can take this path. And each path leads to a different end. So let's explore the paths that are at hand. Now, this episode, I want to start off with, and really it's centered around the great phrase used by um, the convert, the great convert to Christianity, C.S. Lewis. And his phrase is as follows. Jesus is either a liar, he's some kind of crazy man, or he is, in fact, Lord. There is no middle ground. We simply can't say that Jesus is simply a good man, or a great moral teacher, or just a prophet. The evidence does not give us that option. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, there are people that don't believe that Jesus is Lord, but those people don't go around calling Jesus a liar or some crazy man. Together, you and I will discover the evidence behind who Jesus is. And once we discover this evidence, you and I will know that there is no middle ground. You simply can't deny the divinity of Christ and still honor Jesus. Let's see. Who is Jesus? This is foundational to Christianity. And how do you and I discover who Jesus is? Now, if we're honest, we hear about Jesus from another person that we trust and love, okay? It's in being involved in the community, the church, that we first encounter the Lord. And once we come into 
and live in the midst of this loving community, the church, which is his mystical body, we discover various sources for his identity. The Bible, the inspired written word of God. Specifically in the New Testament, we have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These gospels paint a portrait of Jesus. We have the witness of the early church. Jesus said to his disciples to go tell someone and they passed on that written word, that oral word to another generation. And they passed on that oral word. And you and I are in that stream of receiving that oral word of God, okay? The witness of the early church. These sources compel one to make a decision about Christ. Many 21st century unbelievers say Jesus was a good man, but not God. When we carefully evaluate the sources for his identity. The sources don't give us this option. They simply don't. Jesus is either a liar, he's loony, or he is, in fact, who we claim to be, our Lord and Savior. Think about it. If someone were to come in the room right now, as we're talking, as we're speaking, and claim to be our God. If you're honest, how would you respond to that person? I know how I would respond to that person. They come in and say that they're God. I'm thinking, <laughs> this person is on something. <laughs> or they're lying. They have some kind of hidden agenda. At that moment, the farthest thing from my mind is, so-and-so just claimed to be God. He's a great teacher. She's a great moral example. That's the furthest thing from my mind. Why? Because of the nature of the claim. This person just claimed to be my creator. Okay? So let's not get lost in hearing uh, the claim of Jesus so often that its uniqueness, its um, its grandeur is lost on us. We have to go back. What did Jesus claim? Okay? And I want to pose that question. Did Jesus claim to be God? Now think about it before you answer. Did he? Let me help you out. Why was he arrested? Whether you were a believer or non-believer, why was he arrested? He was arrested because of the charge of blasphemy. And what is that? Claiming equality with God. Did Jesus claim to be God? Or did he just come outright and say, you know what? Thomas, Luke, I am your God. Did he come out in that way? Some people are looking for that. And if they don't find that, they say, well, no, Jesus didn't claim to be God. But in... No uncertain terms. The answer to that question of did Jesus claim to be God? The answer is a resounding yes. Yes, he claimed to be God. Let's look at the evidence. The scripture, which is the soul of theology, testifies to this unique claim. Of Jesus and it is unique it's unprecedented Buddha never claimed to be God Muhammad never claimed to be God okay they worked from their human experience to find meaning but they never claimed to be the Almighty and it's a simple argument Jesus is either who he claimed to be or he's some kind of bad man this is the fork we have to make a decision Let's look at the uh, sacred scripture. In the Old Testament, God is described as the bridegroom. Listen to the prophet Isaiah. For the Lord delights in you and makes your land his spouse. As a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice in you. God is the bridegroom. His people are the bride. Now look at what happens in the New Testament. 
in the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. Jesus answered them, Can you make the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Now this is in the context of people asking Jesus why his disciples are not fasting. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. Jesus is identifying himself with the bridegroom. Now the Jewish ear that's familiar with the prophets, they see Jesus identifying himself with the bridegroom, which means what? Jesus is identifying himself with being God. Because God is identified as the bridegroom in the Old Testament. A claim to be God. Let's continue. More biblical support. I am. I am is the name revealed to Moses when he goes up on the mountain. And God appears to him in a burning bush. This is referred to as a theophany. A special manifestation of God. And in Exodus, we have God saying to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. In the New Testament, look at what we have. Jesus takes on that divine title, I am, for himself. In John, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was I am. So they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The key indicator here is, why did they pick up stones? Because they thought he was guilty of blasphemy. How did he blaspheme? He took the I am and applied it to himself. They thought he blasphemed, did he? Well, he didn't if he really was God. Let's continue. More support. We have Jesus forgiving sins. But who can forgive sins but God alone? By the very fact of Jesus forgiving sins in the New Testament is an implicit claim that he does have the authority to do that. He is God himself. Because only God can forgive sins. The Son of God. Peter has posed the question, who do men say that I am? And Peter, led by the grace of the Father, responds, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. He's the son of the living God, which is what? He's equating himself with God because God is referring to the nature. Okay, I have four daughters. Okay, Rhea, Gabrielle, Nyla, Michelle. They are daughters of a man. Does that mean that they are human themselves? Sure it does. That's a requirement of being my daughter. Jesus is the son of God. God is referring to the nature. If Jesus is the son of God, is that a claim that he is God himself? Yes, it is. Now, I know you may be thinking, wait a minute. The term of the title son of God was used in the Old Testament, and it just simply referred to kings. How come we can't have that same interpretation here? Well, let's look at it. It says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. This is a brand new revelation Jesus is talking about. But my father, who is in heaven, not everyone's father, but my father. Okay, this is the ground level understanding of his uniqueness as a son of God. He is a son of God by nature, the only begotten. Continuing, biblical support. I love this one. This is the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Word is a reference to Christ. There is no doubt about it. Jesus claims to be God. And so what are we to do with this claim? How do we explain it? 
just a good man is not an option. If not God, then what is Jesus? He can't be a good man. Why? Because good men don't go around claiming to be God. They know they're not. So if he's not God, then you only have two other options. He's lying or he's a lunatic. Now, does the psychological profile match that? He can't be a liar. You can ask a believer, non-believer. Do they consider Jesus a liar? Well, when you deal with the evidence, when you deal with the stories communicated to us, the psychological profile of a liar does not fit. Liars have selfish motives. What did Jesus gain by dying? He died for a lie. Jesus was always concerned about the other, fulfilling the Father's will. Lies are usually picked from among believable things. Remember, Jesus is a Jew. And Jews believing that God became man is not something that would be on the radar screen. Usually a lie is believable when it can be believed in some kind of way. This is totally out of the box for a Jewish person. So the, the liar profile doesn't fit. What about a lunatic? Well, the psychological profile doesn't fit there either. Upon meeting a lunatic, what happens? You lock them up. Lunatics are never responsible for revolutionizing the world. And that is what Jesus has done. He is the most dominant figure in history. That's even said by non-believers. So his craziness, him being a lunatic, that simply does not fit. What about a myth? Maybe it was made up. Maybe we don't have an accurate text. Maybe it's been changed over time and now we have these claims of Jesus being God, but it wasn't like that from the beginning. Well, we look at the, the gospel text as an ancient text. First, we look at it as more, but first, let's just look at it as an ancient text. And it has to pass um, the various criteria that's applied to any ancient text. One of those methods is textual criticism. Let's look at Iliad, the Iliad written by Homer. How is it, how is an ancient text evaluated on whether or not it's accurate enough? Well, none of the original manuscripts of any ancient document are in existence. Okay, doesn't matter what it's about, they're not in existence. What you have, what we have, are copies. And so what do we do? We look at the number of copies that we have and the amount of time that has passed between the original and the copy. And the more the copies, the shorter the distance, the better. Now the second most attested document in ancient history is the Iliad. And look at what we have, 650 copies of manuscripts from about 1,000 years after the original. And no one seriously debates whether or not we have an accurate translation copy of the Iliad. Now, when you compare the New Testament to the Iliad, look at what we have. We have over 5,000 copies of manuscripts from about one to 300 years after the composition. We have an accurate text. This text is reliable, a 99.5% match. If we can't trust that we have an accurate copy of the New Testament, then we can't trust any ancient document. But we do trust, trust other ancient documents. So why wouldn't we give that same credibility to the New Testament? So we've got an accurate text. What about this whole idea that this is just a big legend? This is just grown out of proportion. It's a kind of myth, legend. Well, when you compare the dating of the New Testament documents, the New Testament, generally speaking, scholars agree that the New Testament texts were written by 90, okay, 80, 90. We know that Jesus died and rose right around 30, 33 AD. You have 60 years between the writing of the New Testament and when the event of his death and resurrection actually happened. 
that's not enough time for a myth to develop. It normally takes about two centuries for a myth to develop. So that's not a real option. What about a guru? Well, guru, guru is untenable. Jesus was a Jew. And the Jewish understanding of God is totally different from the Eastern religion's view of God. Okay, the Eastern's view of religion, view of God, has him essentially connected with his creation, a kind of pantheistic worldview. The Jewish believer considered God as completely other, holy, sacred, set apart. Okay, so Jesus filling the bill of a kind of guru doesn't make sense either. When you objectively look at the evidence. So what we have is this. Jesus was either Lord or a bad man. And the evidence does not point to the fact that Jesus was a bad man. What also testifies to that is no one addresses him as a bad man, even if they are a non-believer. So what are we to do? The only next step, the only logical step is to be moved by God's grace to put our faith, to put our trust in Jesus as being, in fact, who he claimed to be, God. Now, I'm going to be honest. Everyone's not ready for that. This is not something that we can reason into, but we can objectively look at the evidence and see where it's leading. And it is leading to the fact that Jesus is in fact Lord. And I invite you to look at the evidence. I've looked at the evidence. And once you look at the evidence, make a sincere plea to God. God, if you've revealed yourself fully in Christ, please show me. Maybe you're at a point where you're not even, you're doubting God's existence. Start wherever you're at. Lord, if you exist, God, if you exist, please show yourself to me. Show yourself to me in Christ. I'm here to encourage you to look for yourself. Don't just take my word for it. Don't just take your teacher's word for it, your pastor's word for it. Look for yourself. No one can do that for you. No one can do that for me. I have to look for myself and I can testify to the fact that when I look with my whole being, I meet Christ. I can't prove it to anyone, but I know him. He's there. I've met him and I grow in my relationship every day. I want to end with a video clip. And the video clip testifies to uh, an experience of an atheist who honestly looked at the same evidence and by God's grace found his way to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Listen in. The evidence accumulated over time until November the 8th of 1981, which is sort of when I reached a critical mass. I remember going alone in my room and I took a yellow legal pad and put a line down the middle and on one side I started to list all of the evidence I had encountered for Jesus Christ being the Son of God and on the other side all the negative evidence against that and I, I wrote and I wrote page after page and finally I put my pen down and I said wait a minute in light of this avalanche of evidence pointing toward the truth of Christianity it would require more faith for me to maintain my atheism than to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And so that's the moment that I decided, consistent with the evidence, the most logical, the most rational step I could take was a step of faith in the same direction the evidence was pointing and put my trust in Jesus. Jesus is real. May God bless and keep you all the days of your life. I'll see you next time. Peace. Oh, you've been so good to me. I can never count all the ways that you've blessed my life. 
so I simply say thank you. Since you've been around, found, there's no one like you, like you. Since you've been around, found, can't live without you, without you. Since you've been around, now, my life is so new. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you. Since you've been around, found, there's no one like you, like you. Since you've been around, found, can't live without you, without you. Since you've been around, now, my life is so new in you. Since you've been around.